Anesthesiology, a unique and important role within the medical profession that requires intense physical and technical ability, patience as well as compassion. Now, anesthesiologists from across Europe and around the world are coming together in Vienna, Austria. With a rich history in music, art and psychology, this week the city will host the very latest findings and expertise in education and innovation. Across anesthesia, intensive care, pain, patient safety and perioperative medicine. With attendees coming together to save and improve the lives of patients everywhere, we're here for Euroanesthesia 2019. This is Euroanesthesia TV. We're back at the Vienna Mess and Euroanesthesia 2019 has now well and truly begun. We're Euroanesthesia TV and we're here to bring you face to face with some of the top minds in anesthesiology from perioperative care to blood management. Now, we all know anesthesiology is a challenging profession, exerting a heavy physical and emotional toll on those who practice it. We enjoy the new birth, but also we have uh, to uh, face uh, the deep uh, sufferings uh, and death. Uh. We sat down with Professor Paolo Pelosi to discuss what it means to be an anesthesiologist and an exciting in-depth interview coming up in today's show. Also in today's show, we'll be meeting researchers to ask what's new in their field of expertise and hearing about the great ways the ESA is training anesthesiologists. Let's take a look at what's coming up. Children are really our most vulnerable population and while a blood transfusion can be life-saving in a child, it can be life-threatening too. Um, and the line between those is sometimes difficult to find. If the 30 days after surgery were considered a disease, it would be the third leading cause of death in the United States. We lose a lot of patients after surgery. I'm here in the high fidelity simulation space with Professor Salvo Delli. Professor, what's going on here today? Well, it's a simulated operating room where we recreate the real environment of an operating room and we put the participant into the context of uh, managing a serious issue happening to a real patient, which is in fact a very high uh, fidelity and technological mannequin. Maybe we can have a look at the mannequin if you want. It's kind of uh, recreating uh, the whole body, although it's very difficult, but it has its own uh, physi physiological model. It can yeah. breathe by, on its own. It, can, it has a heartbeat. Uh, it has a simulated cardiac output. It has yeah. simulated uh, heart sounds and lung sounds. That sounds incredible. So it's the mannequin that is so innovative, particularly you've just inserted it into the usual patient setup. Why is this kind of simulation practice important? There are some rare events in the operating room that it's difficult to train, for example, yeah. and also some uh, specific competence that we call uh, non-technical skills or crew resource management skills. You cannot do it in a safe way elsewhere than in a simulation room like that. So Professor, can I get a chance to rescue this patient? Okay, it looks to me that he has some abnormal breathing here, so... Oh yeah, from the I screen? Yes, from the screen here. Uh -huh. So I suggest that uh, you're going to have a listen to his lungs. Great. See if everything is okay, so grab the stethoscope. Don't you hear like some wheezing? I think he's having some uh, asthma, asthma and, uh, yeah. and bronchospasm. There's definite okay, wheezing there. Here. Okay, we're yeah. going to deepen the anesthesia and give him some medication now. I put him back to the machine. There's something wrong with him. I'm glad you're looking into it. So thank you so much for letting me rescue this patient, Professor. Now we're going to have a talk to some of the participants you've got coming in. Of course, it was a pleasure. In the simulation space, we have two rooms. The high fidelity room, in which we are for the moment, but also we have a second room, which we call procedural room, in which we teach specific technical uh, procedures uh, for airways or venous access, for example. Uh, today we have been teaching uh, crisis scenarios, that is situation of uh, anesthesia crisis, that is a situation uh, which are very difficult to manage for people and during which uh, anxiety and stress is very high and for which the physicians who are involved in this uh, situation have both 
technical problems because it's very difficult to think about everything which is needed to do and also to manage the group that is what we call the team or the non-technical skills. In the second part of the scenario, what we do is what we call debriefing. Debriefing is a short session. Uh, in, the, in the sim space, we have a 20, 25 minute duration of the debriefing. And during this period, everybody is going to talk with the instructors who ask questions and who try to manage so that the participants try to think about things which are important and that they would improve. For myself, I learn uh, a mistake I do so uh, it's, it's okay, it was with not a real patient, so I can do better after. What I take home is that the gaps between my shock moments will be smaller and smaller because I will be having a plan in my head how to act. You learn how to, to communicate, you can learn out of your mistakes, you can see that all your colleagues are in a similar boat of having stress and anxieties. And I think the more you practice these scenarios, the better you get at it. So it becomes more of a routine rather than just being thrown into that scenario with a real patient and then panicking. And it's uh, very easy to go inside the situation. The first step can be a little bit um, artificial, but it goes very quick and very good uh, way to, to learn. The training facilities are great. I thought the, the equipment is fantastic. It's really high end. Um, the training was really good and the team explaining everything, how, how it works. Everyone has been very reassuring and very calming and very friendly and professional. So I think it's a really great setup um, to come here and do that. It's nice to know how to deal with the critical uh, moments in our practices. We are not getting them a lot and it's better to be prepared because you never know what's coming next in your room. Really exciting to see some of the great work the ESA is doing in training new anesthesiologists. But of course, the ESA is also involved in the accreditation of new anesthesiologists by the European Diploma in Anesthesia and Intensive Care Examination. But who's behind the EDAIC? Let's take a look. The EDAIC stands for European Diploma in Anesthesia and Intensive Care. It's the postgraduate examination that people take uh, during their residency program. There are a couple of things that I would like to mention that are new in uh, EDAIC, and one of them is the introduction of a whole new language into part two examination, and that is Portuguese. We've run it in uh, uh, Sao Paulo this year, and also uh, the electronic uh, uh, way of taking part one is available as well. I've been an EDAIC examiner since, I think, about 2005, so it's 13 years now. I have been an examiner for the European Diploma for about 17 years now. I think the EDAIC sets a common standard for European and even worldwide anaesthetists now. I think it's really important in the current climate of uh, mobility within Europe and I think I really understand this from a personal perspective having worked in four different healthcare systems. To be a good examiner, well, first of all, I think you just need to be a good and enthusiastic doctor, an anaesthetist and intensive care doctor, who is interested in trying to get the best out of our young colleagues. You need to be patient, you need to formulate your questions in a non-threatening way, to be supportive and to listen to the candidates. Within the examination committee, we all think that becoming an examiner is a great fun. Uh, if you are passionate about education, this is the thing for you. We especially look into increase our pool of Portuguese and Polish speaking examiners. So if you're one of them, we'd like you to apply to become examiners for the part two EDAIC. I enjoy being an examiner because it makes me meet a lot of young colleagues who take the exam from now all over Europe and all over the world. And also um, it makes me part of a an extremely enthusiastic and friendly group of examiners. Now, in the latest in our series of trips to some of the world's most exciting anesthesiology facilities, let's go to RWTH Aachen in Germany, 
where training new anaesthesiologists is just the start in their goal to provide high quality, innovative intensive care. It is still very important to improve the care of our critically ill patients because today still too many patients die to their critical illness. We want to bring innovation and quality improvements to our patients to bring more patients back to life. The RWTH University Hospital Aachen is located in Aachen, the most western town in Germany. We have more than 100 ICU beds in my department of intensive care here in Aachen and we deliver the care for more than 5,000 patients every year. The department of Professor Marx offers a total 75 ventilator beds, of which 18 beds for long-term ventilated, 6 burn beds and 28 intermediate care unit beds. The main focus is on patients with sepsis, pulmonary failure, heart failure and polytrauma. Long-term ventilated patients are in particular critically ill. We decided five years ago to install a special unit for those particular critically ill patients and we have really good success in bringing many patients back to life and back to their feet. I have a great problem with my heart and the only solution was go to the ICU. I get from the ICU team very good answers to get a good health and a good future. When we see patients after critical illness return to life, to walking, to speaking, this is a high reward for every single member of staff for all the personal involvement we put into this uh, patient. We want to be the step maker of intensive care development into the future, combining basic research, clinical research, artificial intelligence and big data research to really bring the best to the patient and to deliver precision medicine in the future. We are sitting in the telemedicine center of the University Hospital of Aachen. The Department of Intensive Care Medicine delivers an additional telemedicine service to 17 hospitals around North Rhine-Westphalia. We have scheduled rounds together with our colleagues in the remote hospitals on a daily basis for every patient who is willing to participate. In addition, we provide a 24-7 service. We are not only delivering telemedicine as a routine service, we are also innovating. For example, we are developing an app that will support caregivers on the remote side as well as in the telemedicine center to detect ARDS more frequent and earlier than without digital assistance. At our department we have an excellent infrastructure to combine both in vitro cell culture experiments, animal experiments, but at the same time performing strong clinical trials. Sepsis is one of the leading causes of deaths in intensive care units worldwide with mortality rates up to 50% in patients with a septic shock. We developed small synthetic molecules that proved to significantly reduce systemic inflammatory response in sepsis and finally to improve organ function in sepsis. We hope to develop new theopoietic strategies to control and modulate inflammatory response associated with sepsis. On the other hand, data density in intensive care medicine rises every day. We hope to innovate digital solutions that provide an intelligent overview and provide decision support for the intensive care medicine doctor. I'm working since over 10 years in the field of organ protection and nutrition support for critical ill patients. Although nutrition support belongs to the basic treatments, it still remains largely unrecognized. Less than 60% of nutritional goals are received in the critical ill patients. We have established a network to conduct clinical trials in the field of nutrition and critical care worldwide. Training is a key element um, in intensive care. We try to provide courses that are tailored to all of our members, including physiotherapists, nursery staffs and other therapists as well. We have mentoring programs, um, teaching rounds, but also things like simulation courses and hands-on workshops for our staff members. 
For our ICU beginners, we provide a special ICU starter course that gives them a mix of keynotes, but also hands-on workshops, simulation and advanced life support. We think that a good training is an essential element for our staff members to give our patients early diagnosis and adequate therapy in critical care. It's a daily uh, challenge, but we, we want really to bring the best and encourage everybody to bring the best out of him or her, to bring with enthusiasm really the care to the bed and to the patient. In a minute, I'll be sitting down in the studio for a series of exciting interviews on some of the biggest issues in anesthesiology. But first, let's take a look at some of the other exciting institutions which also feature on Euroanesthesia TV. London is a great place to live and work because it's such a diverse place. I arrived here in uh, London, Ontario about uh, three years ago. Um, and I found it for me the ideal place to be. We send uh, a team with an anesthetist and a cardio technician to the patient to secure a stable condition in which the patient is able to be uh, transported back home. We provide regional anesthesia, neuroaxial regional anesthesia. We have also limbs blocks. So we are probably the leading uh, hospital for regional anesthesia on a national level. It is still very important to improve the care of our critically ill patients because today still too many patients die to their critical illness. We want to bring innovation and quality improvements to our patients to bring more patients back to life. Patient blood management is essential for managing blood transfusion in very ill patients. However, the doses and diagnoses required in adults are very different in children. To find out how, I'm joined by two experts. Why is patient blood management important? Patient blood management has been identified by the World Health Organization as one of the top five most important issues of overuse in the world. So it's compared with antibiotic, we are definitely overusing blood products and we need to define good strategies to minimize the use of this product. Dr. Gooby, could you elaborate on what specific products are being overused and why is this a problem? So the specific products that are being overused include red blood cells but also plasma, uh, platelets and cryoprecipitate. And it's a problem because um, Overtransfusion is a major issue uh, affecting uh, children in our hospitals and being mindful of transfusing when needed the appropriate products in a goal-directed fashion uh, would be a good approach. Why are different patient blood management techniques needed in children versus adults? Children are really our most vulnerable population and while a blood transfusion can be life-saving in a child, it can be life-threatening too. Um, and the line between those is sometimes difficult to find. Dr. Dismer, what patient blood management techniques should be used in children? Well, that's a good question because uh, there's not only one technique that we should use. We need to think about a multimodal approach of our patient. It means that the strategy of blood management has to start before surgery, can continue during surgery and even beyond surgery until the patient is discharged, all with the effort of improving the outcome of our patient. We've been collaborating with Boston Children's Hospital and Genoa Children's Hospital to try to improve the care of uh, babies having surgery and we're using antifibrinolytics like tranexamic acid, we've been doing some work with that. Uh, also just good anemia management, restrictive transfusion th strategies, uh, and the most important thing really is just to try to keep the blood in the patient because it's a vital organ um, and that's the really the safest thing for our babies. What are the most striking innovations you've both heard about today? I think that the future is to identify the correct dosages 
of every single medication for children and neonates. And also we need to clarify and improve the non-invasive techniques because blood drawing is another big issue. So the most we can improve with non-invasive techniques, the better it will be for our patients. I have to add that it's really basic, good surgical technique, good anesthesia technique, and the collaboration between the two. And also just recognizing early that 25% of our children are anemic, and just diagnosing and treating that appropriately before surgery. I understand that new guidelines for pediatric cardiac surgery have been announced. What are they and what are the differences between cardiac and non-cardiac surgery? Um, Dr. David Ferroni spoke about uh, bleeding management and cardiac surgery and there's really new great guidelines that are evidence-based and expert consensus. And those guidelines I outline um, all the major differences and similarities between cardiac and non-cardiac. Um, and some of the differences are that uh, you need the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit, so the blood is circulated outside the body. And in order to do that, uh, it has to be primed, so the blood is diluted. And then the trouble with trying to keep them warm uh, during all of this long surgery. So there are some differences in that cardiac surgery is you know, one of the biggest, most riskiest surgeries with the highest blood loss in our pediatric patients. Fascinating. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. Perioperative risk is a major concern for patients and their families. But what's little understood is that mortality after surgery is often higher than it is intraoperatively. To talk about why that's the case and to think about what anesthesiologists can look out for, I'm here with Professor Daniel Sesler. When do people first get into trouble after an operation and why are those moments missed? It's an interesting question. One would think that if grandma comes in for major surgery and survives and gets to the recovery room alive, that the most dangerous part of her experience is over. It's absolutely untrue. Her risk of dying in the 30 days after surgery is a thousand times higher than her risk of dying during surgery. If the 30 days after surgery were considered a disease, it would be the third leading cause of death in the United States. So people don't die during surgery, they die after surgery. And the major preventable cause of death is myocardial injury. Why are these risks missed? Myocardial injury is typically clinically silent. More than 90% of patients have no symptoms whatsoever. And you might think, okay, they don't have any symptoms, so it's not so serious as the ones who have symptoms, but that's not true. The ones without symptoms and the ones with symptoms die at very nearly the same rate. So the only way to detect it is with a blood test, and you have to monitor it in high-risk or moderate-risk patients whether or not they have symptoms, because most patients don't have symptoms. What can we do to manage all of these risks better? The major thing that we can do to modify risk is probably to avoid hypotension during anesthesia. Hypotension is not the strongest risk factor. Baseline risk is a much more important factor. So people don't get heart attacks after surgery who are perfectly healthy beforehand. The people who get heart attacks after surgery are people who already had cardiovascular disease. But in those patients, having low, low blood pressure during surgery makes it worse. So, and that's a modifiable factor as opposed to baseline risk. The distinction's important because if somebody has cardiovascular disease, they've had a heart attack, they may have had atrial arrhythmias, they might have diabetes or hypertension, all, all these things which are well-known risk factors, you can't change those. They're there, they're serious, but you can't make it go away for an operation. But one thing you can do is prevent them from becoming hypotensive during surgery. How could we implement those systems in practice to manage these risks? During surgery, it's a matter of watching the blood pressure, which anesthesiologists, of course, normally do, but also responding fairly aggressively. In the past, people tolerated relatively low blood pressures, which was perfectly reasonable given our state of knowledge at the time. But now we know better. Now we know that low blood pressure, and it doesn't have to be too terribly low, is associated with myocardial injury and with death. Thank you so much for joining me, Professor Sesler. Okay, thank you much. 
Coming up next is our big interview with Professor Paolo Pelosi. But first, we wanted to find out what drives you in your job. What does it mean to you to be an anesthesiologist? For me, to be an anesthesiologist uh, means almost everything in my, in my life. Because since I got the uh, medical school, I thought to be an anesthesiologist. And my husband is an anesthesiologist too. So in my house, everything uh, is anesthesia. I've always thought it's amazing to give painless surgery every day. So uh, it's the greatest invention, I think, of the last 150 years to provide painless surgery. It's just perfect to help people um, to be comfortable for the surgery and to recover uh, quickly. Anesthesiologist, is, I love anesthesiologists. I work with the children and it's all in my life. It has to be passion, it's what you like. And because there are many ups and downs like in any other jobs, but if you have passion, it, it, it keeps you going. The thing that drives me is to think of the future. What would it look like in 10 years or 20 years from now? If there are any changes, if yes, what changes? Yeah. So that's very interesting, yeah. I think it's many responsibility to, to, to be an anesthesiologist. Um, I think, but so many good things too, about the science, about the, the work. It's a wonderful pleasure for the first time you are saving the lives, you are helping the people. And it is a remarkable job. It's very hard. It means you have to be physically and emotionally very stable, but at least you're enjoying that. You love to be with the people and to help them. It's almost the end of the show here at the Vienna Messe, but it is time for our exciting in-depth interview with this year's Macintosh lecturer, Professor Paolo Pelosi. We caught up with the professor earlier to discuss what it means to live the life of an anesthesiologist. Professor Pelosi, thank you for joining me. In your own words, you've said that anesthesiologists need to have cold blood, but be full of empathy to balance backbone and flexibility. How does an anesthesiologist do that? How do you? Oh, yes. I think uh, this is the exciting uh, side of uh, our profession, that uh, we face uh, every day uh, the black uh, and the white. Uh, uh, we save lives uh, and we try to save lives in more and more humanized way. But on the other side, we face every day, every hour, every minute, uh, the sufferings, uh, the pain and the death. Uh, and this makes our profession completely different from others in medicine or surgery. We enjoy the new birth, but also we have uh, to uh, face uh, the deep sufferings and death of our patients and families. And I think this makes a change in our life and how we interpret our life. You've also said that our most important mission as anesthesiologists is to teach that life and death are essential parts of our existence and that we need to grab every fleeting moment. How do you teach that to other people? We have to teach the younger doctors uh, that if they want uh, to become anesthesiologists and critical care physicians, uh, they need uh, to have this great uh, empathy for the patients and to be ready uh, to face uh, this big uh, contrast. Otherwise, uh, the major risk of our profession is a severe burnout that can have uh, even major negative consequences. That sounds like a really um, serious possibility. You've said that you foresee that the current trend of a shortage in anesthesiologists and intensive care physicians is likely to continue, particularly in rural areas. How can we combat that then? Absolutely. This is one of the major problems that we are facing because it's more and more difficult uh, to find this kind of characteristics, psychological and human characteristics that combine this uh, big contrast. And we have uh, to increase uh, our uh, efforts uh, to show that, however, uh, this is profession uh, 
uh, really makes major changes uh, not only in the life of patients and family, but also in your life. And then, uh, as the Talmud says, uh, uh, when you save one life, uh, is like as you save the, all over the world. It's a beautiful sentiment. It's thought that AI will transform healthcare. How might it transform the requirements of an anesthesiologist? This is the other uh, issue related to our profession. We are a very technological profession, probably one of the most high-tech profession in, in medicine. And on the other side, we have not to forget, as we discussed, the human uh, part of our profession, which is uh, at least as important as the technological one. And I think that high-tech will help us but we have to be prepared to these new technology challenges in the future within our profession. What do you think the next generation needs to do to fit your vision? The first to be ready for multiple tasks. Uh, the second is to have a great empathy, to have clearly in mind uh, the compassion for uh, patients uh, and for families. Third, we have to be ready to listen, to understand the silence, and finally, I think that anesthesiology should be more and more curious uh, regarding uh, the management of our patients. There is a nice sentence from uh, an Italian writer, Tiziano Tizzani, who says that when you have two pathways, one go up and one going down, it's always better to take the pathway which is going, which is going up, up because in that case you don't know what you reach but for sure you have a great hope to find new things. So my suggestion to younger anesthesiology, please in your life take always the path which goes up and never give up. Inspiring stuff Professor Pelosi, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you. Really exciting stuff there from Professor Paolo Pelosi. And we hope anesthesiologists from around the world can take heart in the fact that they're making a real difference. Now, it's the end of the second show here at Europe Anesthesia 2019. It's been a busy day, but we've got still more for you tomorrow as we stop by the Thoracic Anesthesia Workshop and hear from some of the best abstract prize competition winners. Until tomorrow, make sure to catch up on anything you've missed, including yesterday's show. Online, in your hotel, and around the conference center. We'll see you soon.